turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. Uh, this is our, our last week of Endearing Love series, and uh, we talked a lot about relationships, and, and certainly we put a big focus on our um, closest relationships, right? Our, our marriage and family relationships, and um, we are going to morph this into a, a two more weeks where we're, we're going to talk about a broader picture of relationships um, and even how we're to handle when we are um, sinned against and, and ways that we should forgive uh, and ways that we can bring restoration. And so um, that'll be a, a new series starting next Next week, And then after that, we have our missions conference. And we want you to go ahead and plan to be a part of that on the 21st and 22nd. And uh, we're excited about what God's going to do. Uh, the president of ABWE is going to be here, and he's going to share the word for us on that Sunday. And uh, we're very excited to hear what God has laid on his heart. Um, then during the Easter um, three weeks, uh, Palm, not three weeks, but Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday, we're going to have a drama that kind of works through the sermon series. And so I'm going to ask you to go ahead and commit to being here on Palm Sunday, on Good Friday, and Easter so that you can get the full effect of, um, of that uh, worship opportunity. And so we're looking forward to celebrating a risen Savior, and, and we would love for you to be a part of that. And uh, we are glad that you're here today. Let's go ahead and pray before we dive in. Our Father, we are so thankful for your word. Uh, Lord, we look forward to um, what you have to teach us here this morning. And Father, um, thank you for first loving us. The only way that we could have a clue what love is, is because you are love. And Lord, the only hope that we have to live a love that demonstrates Christ's love is to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior and have him in us live through us for the glory of God. And so, Lord, we just pray that um, you would be glorified even in these conversations. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have you ever been a part of a remodel? You, know, you remodel a bathroom, you remodel a kitchen, you remodel, I, I've been a, a part of several, uh, but my wife is really the remodeler, I'm just the go get it guy, right? And, and one of the things that I ask her is, why do you love this so much? It, it, seems, it seems like such a challenge. And she goes, you know what? It is challenging, but when it's finished, it's wonderful. And in some ways, that, that's true of remodeling our relationships, right? We can kind of get into some bad habits. We can kind of get into some everyday um, challenges and difficulties. And, and how do we restructure? How do we, what is the model that we look at to change the way that our relationships are? Well, the model certainly isn't culture because culture does everything it can to bring division into our relationships, to bring selfishness into our relationships. So instead, the model has to be our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he's the model that we're going to look at to see our lives transform, to see our lives change. And the first um, week that we got together and talked about this series, what we realized is that um, we, we tried to answer this question, is it possible to fall in love and stay madly in love forever? Is, is that a possibility? And we said it absolutely is. And not only that that, that, that all of us believe it is. God, because we're created in his image, we all have this desire and feeling that, yes, this is possible. It is possible to love rich and full. Now, John 13, 34, Jesus says this. I'll just remind you of this. A new commandment I give to you. That you love one another, just as I have loved you, also you are to love one another. So Jesus is saying, listen, as you're remodeling your relationships, your relationship with your spouse, your relationship with your children, your relationship with people in the church, what I want you to do is I want you to do this radical new commandment in what I'm doing. I came to earth. I lowered myself coming to earth. So it's a new commandment, a new picture to look at. I've given to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. And we're saying here, Jesus is challenging us to make love not, not something I fall into and out of, but to make love a verb, something that I, I choose to do. Jesus says, I have loved you. I'm not, I'm not going to love you. I, I have loved you and, and you need to love others this way. And so we learn to love from Jesus' love for us. 
um, you, you might say, boy, this is, this is a high standard. And, and Jesus even says, well, let me give you some feet on this. What does it look like to have a Christ-like love? And he says in Ephesians 5, 21, through the Apostle Paul, he challenges us this way. that we're to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So in order for us to look like Christ, in order for us to even bring reverence to the name of Christ, what we're going to do is we're gonna have a relationship of submitting, that I will submit myself to you, that you will submit yourself to me. Now you might say, wait a second, that's, that's a big ask. That, that's a real radical kind of love that I would put someone else as the priority and I would choose to be under them, that I would choose to submit to them. That's a, that's a crazy kind of love. I don't think that that's really possible. Let me just ask you this question. Isn't that the way that you would want to be loved? C couldn't you see that that is a beautiful, effectual, powerful way to be loved? And so here is the, the challenge, is that we are to, like Christ, submit ourselves to whether it's our spouse or, or, or to someone else that is um, a brother or sister in Christ or, or even doesn't know Christ, that, that we would submit ourselves for their good, even above our own. This is a high standard, and it is realistic because Christ has given us the model and he's also given us the spirit that will work this out in our lives. And so the Apostle Paul, he kind of puts real imagery and feet to this as um, we look at Philippians chapter 2 and just look at verses 3 through 8. He starts out and he says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Sounds familiar, right? It's exactly what the Apostle Paul said in the Ephesians passage. He said, here's how it works. Here how, here's how good relationships happen. Now, in this instance, what's taking on is, is there's, there's a, a, a new church planted, and they're, they're Greek Christians, the church of Philippi, and they're having conflict. They're having fights. They're having schisms. They're having challenges. And Paul is saying, listen, this isn't the model for the church and how you're going to get along. This can't be the model. The model needs to look more like Christ. And so he's reminding them, what does this model of Christ look like for their lives? And, and we're going to actually, you know, take this a little bit closer in, uh, not just from a church perspective, but also in a relationship in our home, right? Uh, a, a spouse, a, a, a child, and parent relationship. Here, here's what true love looks like. Here's what um, serving each other looks like. And he says in verse three that it doesn't have selfish ambition, right? There's not a competitiveness to this relationship. We're, we're not competing against each other. Have you ever been with a couple and, and one of them is trying to, to tell a story, and so they're telling this story, and, and, and they're like, and there were, there were two of us that went, no, 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 honey, honey, the other one breaks in. No, there were three. Okay, go on. And, and okay, there were, there were three of us, right? And, and then we went, and, and while we were there, we, we, no, 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 that's not what we did first, honey. Time out. No, no, no. You remember, remember we did this before we did that? Oh, okay. Why, why don't we just have a tendency to step back and let them tell the story? Because we have a tendency to want to interject. We, want, we have a tendency to want to be right. We have a tendency to, to have some selfish ambition, right? I, I, I am important. I know the story better. If you want to stay in love, don't compete. Why do Hollywood relationships never work out? Selfish ambition. You're, you're getting ahead. Your career is successful, mine is not. And there's this, this challenge that begins to take place. And so he, he's saying, look, in humility, in humility, we will, not, we will value others above ourselves. We, we will make decisions believing that they are more important. No, no, I understand that there's some pushback. You might say, wait a second, are you saying that they're 
greater intrinsic value to God than I am? No, 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 that's not the point. That's not what, what, what God through the Apostle Paul is saying here. He's saying, no, 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 no. It's just that in the way that we treat them, it's with a certain amount of respect. It's, it's a certain amount of deference. Not because we think that they are created better or higher than us, just simply because that's the way that Christ has demonstrated his love to us. He's respected us even though we were not deserving of respect. He made himself lower so that he could come and have a relationship with us. We've all been in a place where you're not the most important person in the room, right? Have you ever been to a wedding? If you are a guest at a wedding, newsflash, you're not the most important person in the room. Uh, There will be a long line of people waiting to greet the bride and groom before and after the wedding, pretty much after. And no one's going to line up to greet you. You can be very offended by that. Or you can just realize I'm not the deal today. Um, there, There is going to be a whole congregation that stands and looks back at the bride. But when you walk in, no one's going to notice. You say, why? Because in that circumstance, you're giving deference. You're saying there is someone more important, someone to be lifted up today than me. And, 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 and whether it's been, uh, 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 you, you went and heard a, a, a hero give a speech and, and uh, he, you know, maybe did some, some great things and, and, and you, didn't, you didn't say, excuse me, I don't agree with that. Or, you know, you sat there and listened because of who they were and, and the circumstances that were there. Perhaps you've been invited to your boss's house for dinner and he told an awful joke. What did you do? You laughed. And the reason you laughed is because you're not the most important person in the room at that time. You know, what God is saying is is that when we look at someone else, the word to, in the model of Christ, lower ourselves to love them encourage them, to lift them up, to point them ultimately to Christ so that they will be able to glorify God even through the way that they were loved and encouraged by you. And so in Christ, we, we model and we value others. Let's um, just continue down through this, this passage. Verse four, let each of you look not only on his own interests, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count it equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man and being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. And so here is a huge aspect and point for all of our relationships. In the Christ model, what we do is we value others above ourselves. In verse three, he says this is a humble posture, that that we're to humble ourselves, that we're to, to, in a sense, treat people with awe. Now, listen, when you first started dating, this was something that you did naturally. When your child was first born, this is something that you did naturally. You treated them with awe, right? When I first called Cheryl, when we were dating, she would go, oh, mom, mom, he called, he called. When I call now, she doesn't go, kids, kids, he called, he called, I can't believe it, right? It's it's, it's not the same thing, but but when we first start out, we, you know, when you're a little baby, everything you do is cute, 
As a matter of fact, there couldn't be a more selfless type of love. There couldn't be more of a lowering than to serve a child. And that just goes to show that you don't need to receive back in order to be a humble servant of love. Because all you do is pour into that little one. And every little smile they give you is worth a million dollars. It's amazing how we can start out with, with understanding this principle of humble love, of, of, of a love and actually demonstrating some, some awe and, and it first comes naturally, but, but then God's saying we have to learn to make it intentionally because it won't stay that way. That we have to intentionally choose to serve others. We have to intentionally choose to demonstrate love and to put others' interests above ourselves. And here's what I can tell you. It's deeper and richer and better. Jesus lowered himself, died on a cross so that he could have a relationship with us. And what happened? The result of that was not sadness. The result of that, verse 9, was blessing, was victory. And God's saying in that same way, as we show deference and humility in our loves, we too will see and receive blessing. Verse four, not your interest, but the interest of others. Here's a challenge in my life, and I don't know if it's true of yours. I'm mostly interested in the things that interest me. As long as you're interested in the things that interest me, I'm a happy guy. I'm mostly interested in things that that I like, in things that are naturally good to me, things that are naturally something that I enjoy. I'm not overly interested in something that you might like that doesn't connect with me. And so it has to be a very intentional thing for me to want to be interested in your life, to want to be interested in your likes, to want to be interested in what interests you. And what this passage is saying is, in the model of Christ, we are going to go ahead and and, and to make someone else's interests important to us. And so if you have a close relationship In your marriage, if you have a close relationship with your child, chances are what was important to them became important to you. Your kid likes this sport. You might not know how to play it, but now you're a fan of that sport. You figure it out, right? Your kid's in the spelling bee. You might not know how to spell, but you're helping them out and you're doing your best and you're there. Your wife is interested in this, or your husband's interested in this, then in order for that to continue to be a powerful... Now, again, when we first start dating, this comes natural. Oh, you're a runner. I love running too. You've never ran. You don't even own a pair of running sneakers. But you love that person, so you want to connect. Yes, I'm interested in this, right? Oh, you like this. Your family does this. You have this tradition. I'm interested. I want to have those things as well. And, and, and it's not necessarily natural. It's something that, that God encourages in our heart as we see and look at the model of Christ. You know, I remember my wife got this idea um, for a while that we, we need a garden in our yard. Not in this current house, the house before. I, I, I want a garden. Now, I heard her say it a few times and I just kind of hoped it went away. <laughs> Please don't bring it up again. I, and she says again, you know, I really think we should have a garden. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't need a garden. There's nothing in the garden that I really want to eat. <laughs> it doesn't have Brian's three main food groups, coffee, meat, and ice cream. So I don't need to have a garden. I'm completely happy on my own without a garden. And and, and I also know that that we literally lived on top of what is Plymouth Rock. Like there is no way that this is going to be garden worthy unless we get a rototiller and I work very, very hard and get many, many blisters to make my wife happy. So when she says I want a garden, that just means I got to work a lot at something I don't really care about. Right? So she wears me down. I get the rototiller, rent it, I I, I put in this garden. And then, uh, little seeds, we go shopping and get burpee seeds, which I don't even know what that is for, you know, uh, um, 
tomatoes and then this and then that. And we're, we're putting everything in. And, um, and believe it or not, weeds like gardens. <laughs> and so weeds start growing up in our garden. And, and, and she's very perceptive. And she says, honey, there's weeds in our garden. I said, no, no, no. This is your garden, <laughs> right? I'm here reading the Bible, doing what I do. This is your deal. Go pull the weeds. It didn't work so well. I, I, I can tell you this. I hated that garden. It was, a, it was an eyesore. It grew over. It, we might have eaten two things out of it in the history of that garden. And, and I had a bad attitude through the whole thing. It did not bring love, connection, closeness into our, our marriage. I, I'll tell you what, it would have been a lot easier if we decided to do this thing together. If I decided, if it's important to you, it's important to me. Let's, let's work at this. Let's do this. Now, in some of our lives, I get it, that there's going to be things that we're just not that in, into, but, but it's important as we talk about humility and, and deference to each other, that, that we fight to understand each other and that we fight to even enjoy what it is that they enjoy. Not because it's naturally something that we would choose, but because we chose them or God gave us them. And we're gonna work hard at, maybe dad, you, you don't connect with your son that great. Maybe, maybe you were a jock growing up and, and, and he's more moving towards, you know, the, 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 the mental side of things in school and, 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 and the artist side of things. And you're like, I don't know how to relate. You need to learn how to relate because Christ chose to know you intimately, to work towards you. And so we realize that this is a part of the beautiful picture of, of Jesus and how he has, has made our interests his responsibility even in saving us. And, and, and many times we don't like to do this because it, it interferes with, with our, our number one priority and our number one priority is this, me or you, right? Right? And so deferring to someone else or to taking on someone else's interest and making it interesting to us means less our time for what we want to do and what we want to be and where we want to go. You know, we even are called to do this in the context of the local church. We're called to take our preferences as real and as palpable and as powerful as they are and to make them secondary so that we can love the broader bride of Christ better. And so that means that we all have to, in the context of God bringing many people together, learn humility and deference and, 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 and even giving up some of our own preferences and some of our own desires for the good of the whole and to bring God glory. And so Paul, reading our minds, realizing that we're saying, wait a minute, this is extreme, this is hard. He wants to remind us of the Christ model. And he says, value others above yourself. In verse five, you know, have this mind that is like Jesus' mind. He lowered himself. You know what? We want to stay at least 50-50. Jesus didn't. Jesus lowered himself and became a man. Left heaven. He did not say, I'm going to hold on to my deity. Instead, he said, I'm going to come down and be a servant. He didn't say, I'm going to come, but I want you to worship me. Instead, he said, I'm going to come to serve you, to love you, and lowered himself. Jesus went through his earthly years not, not having people recognize the I am God, fear me, know me. Now, he certainly didn't shy away from claiming deity. And he certainly did miracles in order to, 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 to bring glory to his father. But he went to the least of these and he did not walk around and go, sinner, 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 loser, screw up. 
And even when he spoke truth in love to someone like the woman at the well, he did it in such a a, a perfect balance of truth and grace. Never in a superiority, never in a hateful way. And if anyone had the right to, to say, everyone bowed to me as I walked down the road, it was Christ. Verse seven, it says this, that he emptied himself. He literally made himself nothing. That's interesting. It's it's such a unique picture from the world that, that we would empty ourselves. As a matter of fact, when someone really loves themselves, we say this, he or she is so full of themselves, right? They're so full of themselves. They they just love themselves. They talk about themselves. They serve themselves. And Jesus here gives us this model and this beautiful picture, and he's he's emptying himself. 2,000 years ago, Christ emptied himself and came to this earth so that we could have a relationship with him. He didn't have to do any of that. Why did he do it? What is the point? So that he could save us, know us, serve us. Verse eight, he made a decision to do what? To humble himself, to submit, to place himself under even the death of the cross. He submitted all the way to death. He submitted to being hung, spit on, rejected on a cross. He submitted by even taking on sin, my sin and your sin, although he never sinned. And yet, we want to maintain our rights, what we deserve how we should be recognized. And here we have holy God, ruler above all things, wanting to have a relationship with man and he humbled himself and he gave up all of his rights and he hung on a cross so that you and I could receive salvation in the finished work of the gospel. He says, in a way, I can stay receiving everything that I am due in heaven, but have nothing to do with them because I am holy and I am God. Or I can become one of them and pay for their sins as a holy God. And so he died on the cross. Your He put our deal, our sin, our failures ahead of his glory, his holiness. He opted for a relationship over his rights. And he received God's honor and God's glory as a result. This is is the most amazing, fulfilling love. Listen, if you know a love relationship, that there's humility and that there's deference, it is a couple that is very, very much in love. It is, it is a family that is very, very close. It is a church that has harmony and unity and is a wonderful example to a lost world looking and starving for connection. What are the types of people that God asks us to be, to to remodel into? Well, we see very clearly that we're to be humble people. Verses seven and eight told us that. We're to be humble, to demonstrate the humility of Christ. We're also to be patient people, right? Patient people bring glory to God. What does Proverbs 19.11 say? God Sense makes one slow to anger and is his glory to overlook the offense. 
God is, is saying that we, we, we are to model him, a God that is slow to anger, a God that is able to not in a sense overlook it that he doesn't pay for sin, but to send his son. And we are able to overlook others' offenses because God has paid for our offense. And there are also godly people. Psalm 103 says this. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. So we we see this beautiful picture of God and, and, and what we need to be as people in relationship is a humble people. We need to be a patient people. We need to be a godly people. This is what God has modeled for us. This is how we're to remodel our lives to look and be an example of. I remember years ago, we had a a couple stay at our house and um, the wife, for whatever reason, really talked down to in a disrespectful way to her husband, like, like all the time. Don't forget, blah, 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 blah. Oh, last time you did it wrong. This time, do it right. Blah, 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 blah. And, and, and there was this tension. It was like embarrassing to even be in the room. Well, Cheryl and I would like look at each other. Our mouths would be open. Like, I can't believe this lady's like dressing them down right in front of us. And, and, and there's this, this thing going on. And, and, and so we went to bed that night after a long day. And, and my wife goes, I can't imagine talking to you like that in public. Please tell me I never do that. I said, honey, if you did that, I would find a job where I'm away from home a whole lot. And, and, and now here's the, the honest truth knowing this couple pretty well, everything this lady said was right. He did do it wrong. He was late to whatever. He did forget to call home when she wanted him to call home. And, 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 and you know, if, she would, if I had a conversation with her, I'm sure she'd defend herself. But you don't live with them all the time and blah, 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 and, and this and this and this. And, and, and everything might make sense. And that might be true. But what an awful marriage. What an awful way to exist. What a, what a disglorifying way to say that you're a couple that's a child of God. All the details may be correct, but her model is wrong. Her model is wrong. And that can be true of our lives just like that. We might have the details right, but the model in which, the posture in which, the way in which we go into confrontation is wrong. It's arrogant or one-sided or I'm the boss. And and, and to be honest with you, we can spend the rest of our life being right. We can spend the rest of our life making a point. We can win every single argument. But you'll never be in love at the end of that process. You might gut it out. You might endure. You might hang in there. Jesus didn't come into the world for any other reason than to come towards you and I in our brokenness, in our failure. It was completely an efficacious love. He came to the scarred, the unlovely, the unbeautiful, and he said, I'm going to marry you. I'm going to serve you. He didn't walk around, sinner, sinner, sinner. You're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. Instead, he came and said, come to me. I'll give you rest. You're broken, I can mend you. Flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13.
starting in verse 4 in this love chapter, we, we see things that, that as people that are in love, um, we, we realize that this is, this is a beautiful picture of love. And many of you may have had it in your wedding or, or embroidered in your home somewhere. It is, it is a, a beautiful picture. It's a, a, a challenge. And we, one of these days we'll, we'll unpack this when we're in Galatians and we finish that series and we get to the fruit of the Spirit. We'll unpack the fruit of the Spirit of love and we'll go to this passage. But for today, I just want to point out a few powerful little things in it. Just look at verse 4. Love is patient, right? There, there we go. I, I want to demonstrate Christ. I want to model Christ in me, the hope of glory. And, and, and so I, I, this is not things that we can do on our own. This is through the power of God. This is the fruit of the Spirit coming out of us because we are God's child. So although in one sense I say, yes, we want to work at these things, in another sense, this is God working through us. It's not us doing this. It's not us achieving this. It's to God's glory through his power alone. But when God is in us and we allow him to work through us, we demonstrate patience. We demonstrate kindness. We demonstrate love, right? So love is patient. It's kind. It's loving. It does not envy. It doesn't boast. It's not all about me. I don't have to be right. I don't have to be the first person noticed in the room. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at the wrongdoings of others. Instead, it decides to celebrate the wins together instead of tearing each other down but rejoices with truth. And so what we see is, you know, it's not, it's not taking lists of everything you did wrong. It's not bringing it up again and again and again. And remember that time in 1987 when you, but instead it's looking for ways that you can celebrate today's victories and what God's doing in our lives presently. And then it gets to verse seven. And verse seven is a really challenging verse if you've spent time reading it and looking at it. Love bears all things, right? It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. And you're like, I'm not even sure that that's good advice. I mean, isn't that what codependent people do? Put their head in the sand and just believe anything? Oh, you're lying to me again. I'll believe it because that's what love does. There, there's a little Greek word that Paul repeats time and time again, right? All things, always. Love always looks like this. Love always does that. Love always forgives. Doesn't that make love blind? Well, in some sense, yes. But what God is saying here is not that there's not a time for confrontation. And next week, we'll, we'll really kind of unpack how do we confront in a way that glorifies God. But he's saying that in the space between our expectations and our behavior, we need to show kindness. We need to show a, a, a positive outlook. And so I, I brought a couple signs here today, and uh, we're going to think through this together. And um, then we're going to... We're going to close. In all of our lives, especially in relationships, there's expectations. I have expectations of my wife, my children, the church. You have expectations of your family, of your pastor, of your elders, right? We all have expectations. This is something that every one of us has, expectations. We also are going to see behaviors. Those expectations may not be met. Those expectations may not be fulfilled. And so there's this space. There's this space between our expectations and what happens, my expectation, my hubby will be home before six o'clock. No call. It's after six o'clock. Why isn't he home? Right? What do we decide in this space is really what that verse seven is talking about. It's talking about when we look at someone, we don't go to quick judgment. We don't fill in the blanks for them. We don't already put them on the you failed side. You 
Instead, we think of them in the highest regard. So I think there's one more sign around here. Ah, there it is. So let's just say that I have an expectation and all of a sudden the expectation is not met. Typically, what we do in our flesh is we assume the worst. Assume the worst. They, they didn't care about me. They don't respect me. They always act like this. They never follow through. And this passage is saying, instead of doing that, we're called to believe the best. Believe the best. I, I, I am going to believe that there is a, a, a reasonable expectation, that there, there, is, there, there is a positive that, that God's even going to teach me through this, even if there isn't. I, I'm going to believe that there's something good that can come out of this. And so I don't need to punish. I don't need to crucify. I don't need to bring before the court. Instead, I can demonstrate grace. I can step into this space with an efficacious love, just like Jesus Christ has. There's an expectation that we're sinless. The fact of the matter is, all of us have sinned. So what did Christ do? He came and stood in the space, giving us himself. And so what we need to do is we need to make sure that in the, the, the same way, we find the most generous explanation in these challenges. You know, there's something called a fundamental attribution error. And uh, I'd, I'd like to read it to you, a fundamental attribution error. It's this, and, and, and really it's, it's 1 Corinthians 13, 7. But this is what it is. We tend to attribute the negative behaviors of others to their character. In other words, it's a bad character that they did this. It, it's, a, it's something that's, that, that's inside of them that isn't good or they don't care or they don't have a heart for me and my needs and my circumstances. So we, 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 it's character. While we attribute our own negative behaviors to our environment. It's not, it's not really my fault. I couldn't help it. The, tra the traffic was bad. If you had the day I had, you would have blown up too. Do you understand? And what this is saying is there's a space for us to, to realize that we don't, we don't have to go into a character conversation, but we can give the environment, the, the, the encouragement to someone to say, hey, maybe, maybe they're not doing this on purpose to hurt me. Maybe it's just an accident. Maybe it's just a mistake. I mean, we love filling in the blanks. How many of you have, have ever sat at an exit and at that exit, there was a long line of cars to get off. And there's this guy or a girl that decides they're important and they can't wait in that line. So they go around everyone and just at the last second, they squeeze in and go in front of you. Now, what do you think of that person? You give them charity, a lot of charity, don't you? No, you say, what a jerk. But when you do it, you don't understand, I'm late. I know I feel kind of a jerk by doing this, but the fact of the matter is there's a lot of people depending on me and I need to get there now. Or maybe you're having a baby. Or maybe, you know, who knows? But what I'm saying is, you and I, the first thing we do is we want to fill that space with what a, what a miserable person. He probably yelled at his wife before he got in his car this morning. His kids probably don't even like when he walks in the room. We, we have a tendency to do this. And, and, and what this passage is saying is, look, the way that you stay in love, the way that you stay in love, the way that you demonstrate Christ is instead of putting it right to someone's character, sticking it to them and twisting the knife, instead, where there is space, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men, give them 
grace as much as you possibly can. Is there a time where it has to be handled, where a correction needs to take place? Of course, and we'll talk about that, but I think we jump way too early to those conclusions. And that's why I often love struggles. Because in that space, we're inserting our own pride. In that space, we're inserting our own opinion. In that space, we're attacking their character and not even asking them about their circumstances. And we do not find the most generous explanation and believe it. Instead, we believe the worst. And we all put something in that gap. What do you put in that gap? Do you believe the best? If you do, what that says to your spouse or to your child is this, I respect you. Do you assume the worst? If you do, what that says is this, I condemn you, I condemn you, I condemn you, I condemn you. You do not measure up. You know, we could go around saying, see, I told you so. And sometimes we even like it when they screw up. When we're in the middle, see, you did it again. Proving my point. There you go again. Yes, they screwed up again. I get to rake them under the coals or over the coals. We, we, we love these opportunities. And it's like, what's wrong with us? Why would we want that? Listen, this is what I can tell you. The last thing typically someone wants to do between expectation and behavior is disappoint you. Rarely do they do it on purpose. Rarely was it meant to upset you. Rarely was it meant to hurt you. So don't take it there right away. You, you could say things like, you will never measure up. You're a failure, I'm disappointed in you, but I will tell you this, you're just going to push that person or that child or that spouse or that person in the church farther and farther away from wanting to be next to you, from wanting to speak into your life. And they're going to be afraid of you. Why didn't you call? Because I don't wanna hear the lecture. Why didn't you let me know ahead of time? Because I'd rather get it all over with in one big shot <laughs> instead of, Part two. We need to learn to create margin that says, I'll trust you again. And they might sin against you again. And just like our Savior will say, I will show grace and I'll trust you again. And really, that's the beautiful picture of love, and it is hard, and it's something that all of us have to work in our hearts at remodeling time and time and time again, because we have a selfish tendency to assume the worst and judge. How do you handle your gap between expectation and behavior? In a way that draws people closer to you, or in a way that pushes them away. The more gap that I give them, the better I can model Christ. The better grace will be observed in my own heart and life. And it'll strengthen my relationship with my Savior who forgives me again and again and again. Our hearts are drawn to environments of acceptance. May that be the environment of the church of Jesus Christ. May that be in the environment of your home. One that models Christ. One that doesn't fill the gap with negative demands, but instead Christ-like grace. And Christ put your greatest need above what he rightfully earned. I, I will take your punishment 
I will go in your place and you can receive my glory. You can receive my sinlessness. And so through the cross, we can see and learn a lot about how we should handle our relationships with one another. You might say, boy, I really, really, really love Jesus and I'm so glad that Jesus first loved me. I really like Jesus, but would you dare to have relationships that look like Jesus? Because if you do, you will carry a cross. Would you dare to be like him in the way that you treat others? Would you dare to be like him in the way that you handle relationships? I am so glad that I have a savior that was willing to come down and belittle himself. He came to be mocked. He came to be spit on. He came to be abandoned. He came to be abused. He came to be put on a cross. And yet I scream all the time, I will never let that happen to me. No siree. I'm not gonna let you treat me that way. I have rights. I'm important. He laid down his rights so that he could fight for mine. He married us when we were broken, scarred, a harlot with other loves, and he came and found us and brought us to the Father. Here's what I can tell you. God's not going to ask, did you have a happy marriage when you get to heaven? He's gonna ask this, did you show the world a picture of me through your marriage? And that's a challenge for all of us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the model of Christ. And now as we turn our attention so powerfully to Christ through the breaking of bread and the celebration of the blood that was shed for us in communion, Father, we ask that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to transition now to the Lord's table, and as we do.